Good afternoon. I'm Kim Pellis, director of the Office of NIH History and Stettin Museum, or ONHM. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this second annual Victoria Hardin Lecture in NIH History, part of our History and Context series. And it is my honor to welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Victoria Hardin, director of ONHM from its start in 1986 until her retirement in 2006. Our office is grateful to Vicki not only for the solid foundation she gave us for ONHM, but also for the expertise and guidance she still brings to us as our invaluable special volunteer. Speaking of special, a very special thanks to our favorite magician, Diana Gomez, and to Chris Wanjek for all their help in bringing this lecture and the reception and the research festival itself to us. Now, kindly joining us today to give our esteemed second hardened lecturer a proper introduction, a man who once said that his, quote, go-to approach to a problem is to try to specify a likelihood like solving a fun puzzle. You may know him better as the founder and chief of NIAID's biostatistics research branch, Dr. Dean Fullman. Dr. Fullman. Yeah, that, thanks for that introduction. And now I'll introduce the speaker. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Chris Phillips, who's going to be talking about the founding pioneers of NIH biost biostatistics. And I'm delighted, I'd like to explain why I am. So he's from Carnegie Mellon, where he's a professor, head of the Department of History at Carnegie Mellon. I went to school at Carnegie Mellon, so that's one reason for my delight. The other thing is that I've been interested in the history of biostatistics at NIH for a while. And I think this interest was really sparked about 30 years ago when there was a two-day workshop on to celebrate the 50th anniversary of biostatistics at NIH. So this was organized by Dr. Jonas Ellenberg, and he invited the statisticians who were the founding members to come back to Bethesda. We had a two-day symposium. There were talks. There was mingling. There was a banquet at the Officers Club of the Bethesda Naval Hospital. And um, there was also a poster that I have outside my office. So this talks about the Biostatistics Symposium of 30 years ago. And I was struck by how cool this looked. I thought, nice coloring. And there's this thing here, which I thought was a maypole. You know, it's right here, and it's got this flowing down. But I learned out later that this is actually some Kaplan-Meier curves. It's an artistic rendering of the proportion surviving over time in a three-arm randomized trial. So I looked at this, and if you stare closely, you'll see that they're monotone. And so, in fact, it really is an accurate representation of the survival curve. So if you come by my office, it's outside there, and you can look at this. What's that? My office is in 5601 Fishers Lane at NID. So it's a little hike here but to get there, but you can come there. Um, and so in preparing for this, I read a few um, interviews that were part of that celebration, including one from Sam Greenhouse, where he talked about what the principal mission of that initial cadre of NIH biostatisticians was. And the principal mission was to uh, give the best possible advice you could to, statistical, to the collaborators who worked in the intramural program and to develop methods and theory based on that. And I think that's still the kind of mission we have for the different groups of biostatisticians at NIAID. So with that, I'd like to give a formal introduction to Dr. Chris Phillips. So Dr. Phillips received his PhD in history from Harvard University in 2011, <coughs> and now he is chair of the Department of History at Carnegie Mellon. His research and teaches focus on the history of science in modern America, particularly the spread of mathematical and statistical methods. He's written a few books. I'll mention two of them. One is The New Math, A Political History, and the other one is Scouting and Scoring, How We Know What We Know About Baseball. So he has a knack with titles, as you can see. His current project is a book on the history of statistics and medicine, asking why and how clinical medicine became a science of numbers. So his title today is NIH Biostatistics and the Reformation of Modern Medicine. So Chris? All 
I want to begin by thanking Dr. Fullman for that kind introduction. Uh, and indeed, you'll see uh, that symposium mentioned here in just a minute or two. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Kim Pellis and Dr. Chris Heitman for the invitation. I'm very honored to be the second Hardin lecturer, in no small part because the NIH, and in particular biostatistics at NIH, sent, sit at the center of my ongoing research of the ways in which numbers have transformed medicine across the 20th century. And so I'll begin with some sense of that transition. In 1930, numbers essentially were where they had been in medicine centuries earlier. That is to say, mainly used in public health and epidemiology, the kind of paradigmatic example being the London Bills of Mortality, where deaths from various ailments had been tracked. But by and large, in 1930, numbers were not in clinical medicine. That is to say, when you went to the doctor and you were told that this therapy has a 90% chance of working, that's not actually useful to you. What's useful is whether you're in the 90% or in the 10%. That is to say, the very things statistics are good at are the very things you don't care about necessarily when you're sitting in front of a doctor in the clinic. And so statistics, at least formal statistics, had almost no place in medical training, in medical journals. It was incredibly difficult to find. There are, of course, some exceptions, as any historian would say. And one of the most famous ones is the use of pulse. And so pulse has been used globally uh, as a good example of a kind of quantification method that was widely uh, used in medicine around the globe. And in France and the US, there's also a very famous counterexample in the 1840s where a small group who was entirely ignored, but nevertheless a small group of people that worked at large hospitals quantified cases as a measure of trying to determine whether a therapy was actually effective. This is a bit here uh, from Elisha Bartlett uh, in 1844 uh, uh, talking about how, in fact, uh, a particular disease had been quantified. By 1980, however, numbers are everywhere. You really cannot practice research in medicine or be a practicing physician in the clinic without having some idea of how to deal with statistics in medicine, everything from randomized clinical trials to risk factors, meta-analyses, and similar. I would, I would throw out there, I'm not going to defend this claim, uh, it might be the biggest 50-year shift in the history of Western medicine. I think there's actually a very, very solid argument that th this transformation is in some ways much faster than, for instance, uh, the Robert Koch and uh, Pasteur transformations that we're familiar with. And certainly before that, there's nothing comparable. The reasons for this transformation have already been uh, traced by a number of historians. And so Harry Marx famously argued in The Progress of Experiment that for the physicians and physician researchers, the, the statisticians served as a kind of update of the biochemist. That is to say, whereas in the late 19th century, uh, medical researchers turned to the biochemist for authority, for uh, status, in the mid 20th century, medical researchers turned to statistics for some of the same authority, status, rigor. And a historian like Jeremy Green has noted the transformation in thinking about, say, the definition of disease. So for example, when you define a normal range of cholesterol, that changes how we think about disease and it changes how we think about treating disease because the treatment is effective simply by returning a biomarker to its normal range. And so it changes how we think about the clinical presentation and the therapeutic uh, interventions. As Dr. Fullman uh, mentioned conveniently for me, I am not the first person to notice uh, this particular uh, group and its importance. Uh, this, uh, this group at the NIH was formed in 1947, or as they put it in, in stat joke terms, 1946, plus or minus. Uh, historians would say 1947, nevertheless. Uh, and it was formed when uh, Harold Dorn, the sociologist, was transferred from within the public health service and essentially given the mandate to create a statistical consultative group. He hired Marvin Schneiderman, Jerry Cornfield, uh, Jacob Lieberman, uh, Sam Greenhouse, Nathan Mantell. And they worked then in building T6, which was demolished uh, in the 1960s to put in the parking lot for building 31, in case that's of interest to those locally. 
this group was small. Even 10 years after its founding, there were only about 50 statisticians in the late 1950s who worked at NIH. So it's not a big group. But this exact period of the 1950s, as many of you will know, was a period of rapid expansion, both in funding of NIH, and so it's almost, you can kind of <laughs> do this graph, it doesn't matter what the years on the bottom are. Uh, it really, you could do it for any number of years between 1940s and the 1990s in terms of funding at NIH, it would look similar. Uh, and you can also measure their influence by thinking of them in the network of publication. So if you look at, for instance, something like cancer, and research on cancer, uh, their role here is, uh, it's a little hard to see, but they're in the red in the middle there. And they're basically the best connected of all cancer researchers in the 40 years after 1950. That is to say, if you're thinking about their importance, their, their size is not the right way to think about it. It's actually where they're located, the fact that they're at NIH during this exact period that NIH is sponsoring so much research. Their significance for statistics and biostatistics has been well chased by, indeed, Jonas Ellenberg, Mitchell Gale, Nancy Geller, others, mainly in the late 1990s uh, when a number of the initial members were uh, getting up in age and they wanted to have these interviews to try and record their importance. More broadly, we know from historical work that they, this small group was important in introducing computing uh, to the biomedical field. They were also important for changing notions of causation and causal inference. That was done by Mark Prascandola a few years ago. They were important for the place of grant making within NIH, that is to say, actually administering the grants and keeping track of the statistics of grants. That was work done by Sejal Patel. And they were important for building clinical consensus at the NIH, some of the most important work uh, done by Todd Olszewski, all these were Stetton Fellows who operated at the Office of NIH History, and so just putting in a plug for the importance of precisely this kind of support so that we know who, in fact, does this research and what kind of impact they have on the broader world. If it's not supported, we just won't know. Today, I want to focus on placing this group not in the context of history of medicine uh, alone, but this NIH group in kind of a broader historical context. Partly that's because I'm a historian of science, not a historian of medicine, at least in my initial training, and partly that's because I think we now have a different perspective than we had in the 1980s and 1990s. That is to say, we can see this period between the 1930s and 1980s with much more remove, which to a historian is a happy thing uh, as a general matter. This work is part of an ongoing book called, the, at least temporarily called, The Rise of Biostatistics and the Reformation of Modern Medicine. I want to be sure to thank the National Library of Medicine for support from an NIH award as well as a DeBakey Fellowship, and want to call out the Office of NIH History for being an excellent host both during this visit and for other archival trips. So what do I mean by biostatistics uh, in context? Well, part of what I mean is thinking of medicine as a social science, that is to say, returning medicine uh, to its place, not as a biomedical science, but as a social science, which uh, I'll say what I mean in a minute here. Thinking of causality and consensus and how we treat those in medicine, observation and experiment, looking at who is a statistician, and then at the end, I'm gonna return to this idea of the reformation of modern medicine and what I mean. My argument, uh, just to kind of give it in short here, is that they made their transformation, their, their profound transformation, by coming from outside medicine. That is to say, they were not caught up in all the concerns about numbers in medicine traditionally. So biostatistics as a field had its power because it reconceived how to treat medicine statistically. That is to say, it was not focused on uh, epidemiology or traditional public health statistics, but rather medicine just became one more field with variability, uncertainty, and causal complexity. And those were areas best treated by statistics. So the irony is that the NIH group transformed medicine not from being at the core of medicine, but actually from being outsiders who were imported into one of the most important funders of medicine uh, in the mid 20th century. So my first topic here for today is going to be thinking about medicine as a social scientist, uh, social science, excuse me. The two people I'll focus on uh, in this talk and, and, and 
to try and just simplify things are indeed Harold Dorn, who is the, I think of him as the kind of personnel manager. He was the hire, he was the one who really made things work uh, in terms of organizing this group. And then Jerry Cornfield, who I think of as really the leader in statistical theory. That is to say, he was pushing forward a lot of the new statistical theory uh, in this period. Interestingly, neither of them had been trained in medicine. Uh, Dorn was trained in sociology under Sam Stouffer uh, and at Wisconsin. Cornfield was trained in history, so that's why I like the guy, uh, at NYU. Uh, both of them learned statistics on the job, and they got their jobs basically because they were hiring in the Great Depression. That is to say, their first jobs uh, for Dorn was with the National Health Survey, which is how he got into the National Cancer Institute when they did the cancer uh, morbidity survey later in the 1930s, and he had transfers within that to becoming uh, part of the NIH. Uh, Cornfield, however, was just a clerk for the Bureau of Labor Statistics initially, going around surveying people in the Great Depression, seeing how they could model the needs of those uh, who were receiving benefits from the government. But the fact that they were coming from labor statistics, from sociology, did not mean that they were in the backwaters of statistics. In fact, for the early part of the century, epidemiology and vital statistics were much closer to the backwaters of statistics, in fact, than economics and sociology. A lot of the leading research in statistics for the first few decades of the 20th century was actually precisely in demography, in genetics, in uh, agricultural statistics. This was where a lot of the energy in research was done. By the 20s and 30s, it was also in uh, economics. So I think it's important that they were not tied to the ways in which numbers had long been used in medicine. And I want to give uh, an example. So the example I'm going to give, I, I tried to pick some low-hanging fruit here uh, that hopefully most people are familiar with. That is to say the Framingham Heart Study, uh, begun in 1948. And the Framingham Heart Study is perhaps one of the most famous uses of statistics in observational medicine from this early period of the late 40s and early 50s. And for the Framingham Heart Study, uh, the main problem in, in the late 40s was that cardiologists didn't have a good sense of how heart disease progressed, either within the body or progressed in the sense of finding factors that might predict the later onset of heart disease. So it was conceived initially as a clinical investigation on a community level, which meant that basically cardiologists and epidemiologists would survey the population of uh, a kind of subset of the population of Framingham, Massachusetts every two years. They would find associations that later would allow them to make correlations between biomedical markers in the clinic or occupational factors or behaviors with the later incidence of heart disease. Statistics for this project were essentially as they had been used for a long time. That is to say, if you look at Framingham's initial publications, what you get are the statistics of the 19-teens, the 1920s, the 1930s. So this example from 1962 presents some of the first uh, six years of data. And basically what they did was uh, cross-classify different levels of cholesterol here with uh, incidence of morbidity, finding that if you have very high cholesterol, uh, you have a high association with uh, the later onset of coronary heart disease. This sort of thing is interesting and important but the higher-ups at the Heart Institute and the higher-ups at the, the NIH were not convinced that it needed to continue to be funded. After all, once you know that high cholesterol is associated with heart disease, why keep the study going? And as we know, Framingham was kept going uh, through this period. And so there was a great deal of pressure applied in the early 1960s to make these findings clinically, clinically meaningful. And that is to say, what happens if you lower your cholesterol? Does that have any effect on the incidence of heart disease? How does cholesterol inter interact with other potential factors? Does it have anything to do, for instance, with blood pressure? And so they needed a new way, a new statistical approach to thinking about this problem. And they brought in, at that point, the lead biostatistician at the Heart Institute, who was none other uh, than Jerry Cornfield. He was actually brought in by uh, Tavia Gordon, who was uh, one of the key statisticians who was working on uh, the Framingham Project. And what Jerry Cornfield did was think of these factors not as associated with disease, but as kind of doses for a disease. That is to say, you could think of all these factors, and you don't care whether they're causal or not. 
It's just having a bunch of doses, the outcome of which is a disease. And so he wanted to work backwards. And he said, what we should do is use a model where you're predicting from a clinical uh, encounter whether that person in six years or eight years will end up in the coronary heart disease population or the non-coronary heart disease population. The way he did it was using what at that point was a very old statistical tool, discriminant functions, and he used a relatively novel interpretation of uh, Bayes' theorem, at least novel uh, in the sense that it wasn't widely used in this point uh, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and he tried to come up with a formula for the probability of heart disease given the factors that you present at any one time. The upshot of this initial research is that you can actually do things like treating cholesterol as a continuous variable. That is to say, what happens when cholesterol varies? You can have the interaction between cholesterol and systolic blood pressure and ask what happens if you hold your blood pressure constant but increase your cholesterol, these sorts of things. In other words, you can take the same data. There was no new data. It's the same data, but you can get clinically meaningful Re, uh, results out of that same data. This, of course, uh, many of you will know, is still the way we think about Framingham. That is to say, I found this on www.easycalculation.com, so you know it must be easy. And what you do is you simply take your variables, you take your inputs, you press the big red calculate button, and then you get out a 10-year risk of developing coronary heart disease. But what I want to suggest here is that this is actually a fundamental change in how researchers at the time thought about these kinds of observational studies over time. Not as creating associations, but rather as creating predictive equations. There's, there's a lot more to the story, it goes without saying, but I want at this point simply to emphasize that Dorn and Cornfield here part of what they were doing is undermining the distinction between epidemiology and clinical medicine, undermining the distinction between individuals and aggregates, and instead thinking of individuals as an aggregate of variables. And then you can do the statistics and, uh, of, of uh, the analytica statistical intervention on the group of variables, not on, say, a group of people. And so by not getting caught up in these distinctions between laboratory research and cardiology or the clinical presentation of heart disease or prevalence rates, what they were able to do is approach it like an economist or a sociologist would and say, we, we don't really know what's going on, but we can predict what's going to happen. And it's exactly that kind of intervention, I think, that transforms the importance of Framingham. And it does so uh, in some ways from within. My next uh, topic is to think more about this idea of causality, right? If, we, if we're not interested in causality in the way in which physicians might be interested in it, how do we get to these questions? And again, I'm going to take what is hopefully a very familiar example from the history of the public health service, that is to say, uh, the 1964 report Smoking and Health, very famously linking, uh, at least in men, uh, smoking of cigarettes with the uh, onset of lung cancer. The main kind of key bit of the report, at least as we think about it now, is the five criteria that were supplied for taking an association, a statistical association, and turning it into a causal claim. And that was consistency, strength, specificity, the temporal relationship, and the coherence of the association, along with a similar set of of, of um, guidelines that appeared the next year from Bradford Hill, these really have become the paradigmatic ways in which associational evidence uh, is turned into causal claims. What's often forgotten is that this part of the report, and indeed all the key bits of the report, were written by a statistician, William Cochran, who served on uh, the Surgeon General's committee. William Cochran at that point it was at Harvard who had been at Hopkins, and he was not just a contemporary of Dorn in terms of age and had known them for a long time, but actually he explicitly relied on the work that Dorn and Cornfield had done just a few years earlier as part of the Cancer Institute's investigation of the evidence of smoking and lung cancer. And in particular, what Cochran built on was the Cornfield group emphasis on relative mortality or what they called the mortality ratio. And so this is how they made the argument. If you look at what people die of, that is to say, if you have on the left 
causes of death, and on the right, a mortality ratio, which is simply the ratio of expected deaths if uh, smoking has no relationship, no causal relationship to that cause of death, and the actual number of observed deaths. And if you do it across all the prospective and retrospective studies, that is to say, if you aggregate all the studies that have been done at this point, you can have a kind of summary measure of the relationship between uh, mortality and uh, smoking or not smoking. Now, the problem they faced was that most smokers die of coronary artery disease. Most smokers do not die of lung cancer. In fact, it's by a factor of 10 that you're more likely to die of coronary artery disease. But they rejected this absolute measure of mortality because they say that doesn't tell you much. That doesn't actually tell you what is specific and strong and consistent about a statistical relationship. Rather, what you should look at is the change in mortality going from being a non-smoker to a smoker, even though, of course, this wasn't an experimental study where people uh, were randomized into become a smoker group and don't become a smoker group, but rather using the observational studies to make these kinds of, of determinations. And so the expected number of deaths to the observed uh, number of deaths was a ratio of over 10. That is to say, you had a tenfold increase uh, in cancer of the lung among the smokers in this group. What is significant for me, and, and I should say there's a lot more to say about this, and Mark Prescondola and others have done great research on this and thinking about causal factors and the change over time. But what I want to focus on here is that this comes, for me at least, out of a much older emphasis on industrial health. That is to say, industrial medicine, which would have been the context in which someone like Dorn or Cornfield would have been trained. And it comes much more from industrial health than, say, from thinking of causation like Robert Koch or somebody else who thinks about it in terms of microorganism or some sort of single factor, the presence of which indicates disease, the absence of which indicates uh, lack of disease. To people like Dorn and Cornfield, and they make this comparison explicitly, the problem is that we can inject people with the tuberculosis bacilli and have them not develop tuberculosis. In other words, it never works as cleanly as the kind of lab version of medicine would have it work. And so instead, they said, we need to think more broadly. And the way they thought was in terms of industrial health. I should say this is also, it's not just Dorn and Cornfield, people like uh, Bradford Hill and Major Greenwood, that is to say the major biostatisticians in the UK, also got their start in industrial health. So the example I'm going to use, uh, again, is hopefully familiar to those of you who haven't had history in a while, but you might have a vague memory of the 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. This is a very famous incident in Lower Manhattan where a factory catches on fire, uh, and then uh, hundreds of people are killed, some being crushed against doors, some uh, jumping to their deaths. But when this group of people and their families goes to sue the Triangle Shirtwaist company, they typically lose, and they lose consistently. And the reason why they lose in, in uh, wrongful death suits is that there is no direct individual mechanical causal connection between the employer and the injured worker. And indeed, there's a whole body of research that's happening in the 1910s. Maybe the most famous, uh, at least in Pittsburgh, is the uh, Crystal Eastman, again, a sociologist, who famously studied uh, work accidents in the law, thinking of accidents in, in, say, the steel industry. How do we actually connect these accidents to industrial medicine? And, and this level of research moved from something like direct mechanical cause to instead thinking of it in terms of foreseeability. That is to say, could the company foresee the possible harm that would come to its employees? In this, what le legal historians have called common sense causality actually becomes very, very influential, for example, in uh, suits involving asbestos later in the century. That is to say, how can you connect company uh, policy, company action with specific harms, even though there's a great deal of complexity and um, factors that go between what the company does and the harm that comes back. What I want to suggest here, without actually having any sort of smoking gun, to say that uh, unfortunately our actors, they don't write these things down, so those of you who are doing science, if you get famous, please write it down. Uh, but what I would say is that it seems like they are thinking of the prevention of disease, just like Crystal Eastman would be thinking of the prevention 
of industrial harms. That is to say, the way you deal with it was that you try and figure out in a kind of reasoned, ju a reasoned judgment how you get from a set of factors, all of which are kind of complex and may not have one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence with their uh, reputed effects, to actually being able to make a causal claim. And I would say what is essentially required is the need for syn synthesis of evidence followed by reasoned judgment. And that's actually how William Cochrane did it when he uh, served on that committee. So the records of the Surgeon General over in the National Archives make it very clear that the Surgeon General and the committee itself put Cochrane in charge of basically synthesizing all the evidence against across all the groups. Cochrane himself had done this back in the 1930s because one of his first questions was we have all this agricultural research going on. It'd be nice if we could aggregate it into one measure, what we now might think of as a kind of meta-analysis. And that was some of his original contributions to statistics. And then in the 1960s, he thought of it similarly. What happens if we can aggregate all these studies and then come to a reasoned judgment about it? This, of course, is... Uh, Regrettably not a simple process, but as Dorn, Corn, Dorn's group, that is to say Cornfield et al. put it in 1959, a universe in which cause and effect always have a one-to-one -one correspondence which, with, with each other would indeed be easier to understand, but it is obviously not the kind we inhabit. Right? We just don't get to live in that kind of world. And if you want to make causal claims, you're stuck doing it with statistics. You don't have the luxury of relying on experimentation. My next example comes out of this kind of blending of uh, observational and experimental evidence that was characteristic of uh, the Surgeon General's report. And in particular, I want to talk about uh, briefly about the ways in which somebody like Cornfield or, or Dorn, they're actually kind of heretical at the time, which is to say they don't make stark distinctions between randomization and non-randomization, observation and experiment. Their point is that all evidence has flaws. And it's really up to the statistician to make sense of what flaws there are. And in particular, if you're making a causal claim, to, ev to evaluate the evidence for one causal relationship against what might be an alternative causal relationship. And I want to get to what they're doing here with an example from something that's often forgotten as a part of statistics in medicine, but which actually was the very first thing that statisticians were brought to the Cancer Institute to do, which is to deal with the problem of low-dose toxicity, in particular in early chemotherapeutic agents, the need to figure out how to design early chemotherapeutic agents that would be safe enough to administer but harmful enough uh, to be effective. And so this was precisely the question that they approached of low-dose toxicity. It turns out uh, to be a tricky thing but for practical and for ethical reasons, of course. But it's also tricky because much of toxicology in the 1940s assumed a threshold model. That is to say there was a dose below which you could have no ill effects. But this was challenged by the increasing uh, research in radiation which seemed to suggest that for something like radiation, there was no threshold, that at any dose, radiation was irreversible and cumulative in its carcinogenic effects. And if there's no threshold, then you're going to have to deal with this problem of giving incredibly low doses to animals or other experimental uh, settings and trying to extrapolate what the effect on humans would be. The classic approach to this had been given in the 1930s by Charles Bliss, an entomologist. He, ironically, was interested in the opposite problem. He was interested in how much pesticide do you need to kill all the animals, uh, which, of course, is a, uh, the kind of other end of the spectrum. So he's interested in the top level. Almost all dose-response relationships have this classic S-curve, which is to say at low doses, no, di no, no animals die. At high doses, all of them die. Uh, and the question here is how do you actually uh, move from this to thinking of the potential harms of low-dose radiation? I should say even in the 30s, he uses uh, dotted lines at the bottom to show that it's a problem down there, right? That is a classic 1930s graph speak for we're not quite sure how to deal with this. 
indeed this becomes the problem. I should say it's a little more complicated for those of you who work on this. It's actually the probit approach, and so they convert percentage death, and they think of it rather uh, as uh, uh, probabilistically. But in any case, and of course they take the log to make it straight, as we know, you would never, never, never deal with that. But in any case, it's the same kind of thinking about high-dose, low-dose problems. So just a few weeks after Thanksgiving in 1959, one of the great uh, headlines of all time, the great cranberry scare of 1959 uh, occurs. And this happens just before Thanksgiving when uh, Arthur Fleming, then the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, issued a warning that some of that year's cranberry crop had been found to have remnants of a herbicide that was linked to cancerous growth in animals. And so he suspends all sales of cranberry just a couple weeks before Christmas, uh, before Christmas, <laughs> before Thanksgiving. Uh, and uh, then just before Thanksgiving, he rescinds his order and says, it's safe now to eat cranberries on Thanksgiving. Uh, this did not please the cranberry industry at all. And in, indeed empowered, he felt, uh, Fleming felt empowered by the previous year's passage of the food additive amendments, and in particular the Delaney Clause, which prohibited any substance to be sold, no causing cancer in humans or animals. But the resulting fear and the panic essentially led the associate director of the Cancer Institute, uh, Burroughs Miter at that time, to turn to his statisticians and say, we need a solution to this problem. We need to have a way of dealing with low doses of something like herbicides in the food supply. And so uh, statistician Nathan Mantel and his colleague, uh, cancer uh, researcher Ray Bryan, indeed turned to this question of safety testing of potentially carcinogenic agents. I should say someone like Mantel, this wasn't a new project in the 1950s. Actually, the very first thing he published was co-written with Cornfield, our same Cornfield, and it was precisely on the calculation of uh, dose response curves. And so this is something he'd been thinking about for a long time. Mantel and Bryan uh, started what would become their 1961 article on this safety testing by assuming that we have to allow some level of risk. There's always going to be a level of risk. And so instead of saying, what's the risk of this dose? Instead, they said, just give us the risk that's cool. Give us the risk that's acceptable and we will infer the dose that you can uh, uh, expose people to across a lifetime. They called this, using scare quotes, which is a detail I love, the virtual safe dose. It may not be safe, it's definitely virtual, but nevertheless, it's something we can compute. And so the way they compute this is that, uh, this is uh, how they reasoned, they would take the uh, set of experimental data, they would take the lowest data point they have where you see a response, and then they would extrapolate downwards on what they thought was a conservative slope, so not the actual slope of the data, but a conservative slope to get down to the lowest dose that corresponds with whatever risk that the secretary of HEW or whoever else tells them is acceptable. And they called this the virtual safe dose. This method became used by the FDA's panel on carcinogenesis just a few years later as the first acceptable method for dealing with low-dose carcinogenicity. And similarly, the EPA uh, in the early 1970s would issue uh, guidelines based on the same uh, method or similar methods. So my point here is that for somebody like Mantel, for, for his statistics group, there were no simple yes or no answers, right? The statistics couldn't give you what's safe or not, but they could give you a way to deal with a problem of low-dose exposure. Because in, mental, in medicine and health, there were just few in any cut and dried, few if any cut and dried rules. And so you needed statistics to make sense of the animal experiments, of uh, the epidemiological studies. And it's only by synthesizing this kind of evidence that you can arrive at any kind of consensus about what's safe in the case of herbicide residue or in the case of cigarettes, what's unsafe. So I could go on uh, with these examples. I've, I've actually rather intentionally, if, if uh, dramatically, have skipped clinical trials on which uh, they also worked extensively on the development of clinical trials, particularly in the design of flexible trials. But I could spend more than an hour on, on the development of clinical trials in this period, but I'm happy to talk more if people have questions on how they intersected with the history of clinical trials. For now, though, I want to talk a little bit about who was a statistician in, the, in this period. And in fact, to kind of bolster my claim that these were outsiders in more ways than one. 
So we've long known that really anyone who wasn't a straight white Christian man was denied access to most of the pathways and jobs in academic medicine involving mathematics and al alternatively in fields like physics that deem themselves suitably mathy to discriminate in the same way. You would have the same kind of effects observed in this period. But there's been one long glaring exception, and that's statistics in the federal government has always been a more welcoming field than almost any other across the kind of technical fields. Now, I will say, you look at Doran and Cornfield in 2024, and your first thought isn't, my, that's a, that's a diverse group of people there they have at, uh, at, at the, the NIH. But nevertheless, as the joke went at the time, and it's one of those jokes that is telling for historians, Doran's selection bias produced a non-representative cohort of New York born and bred. And for New York, just read Jewish. And indeed, what you have here are Jerome Cornfield, Jacob Lieberman, Nathan Mantel, Samuel Greenhouse, Marvin Schneiderman. And in fact, you could simply look at the, uh, the high school yearbooks and tell a lot about this particular uh, group of people, which is to say that, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find in my notes here. Yes, in 1939 at City College, uh, you get not only Nathan Mantel and Marvin Schneiderman graduating in the same city college year, but you also have Bernie Greenberg, who would long to be a longtime leader of statistics at the University of North Carolina. And so this is a, a small group of people, by and large, denied access to academic mathematics who move into uh, the fields through statistics. Going back, there's also far more visible women in statistics than in comparable technical fields. As Margaret Rossiter's landmark research has noted for, for decades now, uh, women in the sciences were often limited to clerical and social service roles, but this very limitation prepared them exceptionally well for the clerical and social service roles that statistics offered. So the fields in which statistics was most widely practiced in the early 20th century, that is to say, public health, sanitation, hygiene, agriculture, economics, labor, social services, these were primarily uh, professions that had been coded at one point or another as women's work. So in particular, I shouldn't say this is somehow a, uh, uh, a model of kindness. And so for instance, the head of the hygienic laboratory, who would, uh, as we know, what would later become uh, a, a key forerunner of the National Institute of Health, George McCoy, he said he saw the hiring of st women as statisticians as a way to acquire highly qualified employees at discount prices. And so it was a very effective way to get what you needed and save the government money. The statistical and scientific positions available to women were indeed often low paid and precarious with little room for improvement, but nevertheless, they put people in positions of authority and power that other avenues of technical employment did not. So the Census Bureau's best mathematician for the first half of the 20th century is a little known person named Elberti Foudre. She essentially did all the life table calculations for the census through this period without much credit or pay. And there's nothing surprising here. So even in the case of the London Bills of Mortality, by and large, it was women who collected the data that then went into the London Bills of Mortality. So there's nothing new about this for someone like Florence Nightingale. People always ma marvel that she's both a nurse and a statistician. To which someone says, of course she's a nurse and a statistician. That's the kind of model of combining uh, uh, rigorous data acquisition with a focus on healing. And as we've seen more recently in films and books like Hidden Figures, women were often the literal calculators and computers by which the government operated. The bottom line for me is that around 1940, women were about 10 percent of government statisticians. And if you look more detailed in the decades to come, it, the, the trend continues. So in public health methods, which is generally where statistics was done, about two thirds of the workforce was uh, uh, constituted by women in 1943. 1951, you have a small group at the National Institute of Mental Health, but one of them, Anita Bond, uh, would soon lead their um, uh, soon become chief of their uh, uh, extramural statistical uh, service. And then by 1965, the Cancer Institute probably is the best example where women make up about 16% of staff, about 14% of the technical staff, but about a third of statisticians in the mid-1960s rising through the 1970s. And I'm still working on other dimensions. I should say this, this research is ongoing because it's sometimes very hard to kind of recapture some of these histories. But I'm working on other dimensions that 
on the way in which statisticians better reflect the racial and ethnic diversity of the U.S. So in particular, I'm thinking of people like Gladys Handy, who has a master's degree in sociology from Howard, who works both for the census and for mental health as a statistician, and then becomes a health statistician at the Pan American Bureau of the WHO. And what's interesting to me is in part how normal somebody like Mrs. Handy seems in the context of somebody like Dorn. That is to say, a trained sociologist who moves from the Census Bureau through a kind of social science analyst at the, at the National Institute of Mental Health to being a health statistician. That is to say, on one hand, it's an unusual trajectory. On the other hand, it's actually a well-worn trajectory uh, by the 1950s. Now, counting people is not a good way to talk about diversity in America, but I would say statisticians at the government level, statisticians within the NIH and elsewhere, have a uh, outsized impact. This is in part because the NIH essentially creates biostatistical programs around the country. So I'm not going to spend much time on this uh, today, but starting in 1956, it's the NIH who essentially funds faculty uh, stipends, graduate student stipends at public health schools around the country, seeding the biostatistical groups that uh, then take place at Berkeley, Hopkins, Pitt, Harvard, Minnesota, UNC, Tulane, Stanford, Michigan, basically anywhere in this period with a sizable biostatistics group is funded almost entirely, uh, at least in the first years, by, by NIH. So it has an outsized impact. If you bring people in, you employ them at the NIH, you create jobs for them in uh, universities, and then you can seed those jobs with the people you have trained. And so they have a much larger impact than you might think. So now I want to kind of return to my title just for a few concluding thoughts here and focus a little bit on what I mean by reformation of modern medicine. So I'm calling it a reformation in part because what I think is happening from this wide angle historical view, that is to say, if we think about this as a 50 year period situated in a much longer trajectory, what we see is that clinical medicine, medical research is being reformed using the methods and concepts of statistics, but statistics is how they had been used in other settings. That is to say, statistics and how they had been used in sociology, or economics, and so it's a new way of thinking about numbers in medicine that in turn changes the practice of medicine and gets internalized as what we now consider medical statistics. And so if you look, for example, in epidemiology textbooks between 1930s and 1980s, you move from we don't really talk about causes to we only talk about causes over this exact period. And what happens is not that trained epidemiologists, per se, have introduced new methods. It's that epidemiologists have taken on methods like what is being done uh, by these NIH biostatisticians at places like Framingham and re excuse me, reinterpreting them as epidemiological methods. We can see this, I think, if we think of two of the most recent paradigms of medicine and medical research. So if we take uh, the now passe evidence-based medicine, uh, where you treat the disease and you find the best way of treating a disease, basically all the blocks of the classic textbook pyramid are just biostatistics. That is to say, case-controlled studies, cohort studies, randomized clinical trials, meta-analyses. As you move up the pyramid of evidence-based medicine, basically you're moving up a statistical pyramid. Or it's newer, uh, uh, you know, trendier rival, precision medicine, uh, where you don't treat the disease, you treat the patient. Again, all the building blocks are premised on a sophisticated use of statistical analysis. That is to say, genomic data, clinical biomarkers are used to link uh, clinical presentation with the eventual onset of disease. We can see this locally here in the All of Us uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, because if you look at, say, the data browser as of February of last year, 409,000 participants, and what is this really other than a giant statistical, uh, prog um, statistical research center for trying to figure out which associations are clinically relevant, which associations might be causal. How could we make sense of this overwhelming amount of associational data? Similarly, if you look at, for example, uh, some of the leading research papers in precision medicine, so this is a single patient in an in-of-one trial research, 
uh, it's now about 10 years old to a historian, of course, 10 years old is basically yesterday. Uh, but nevertheless, a kind of uh, paper of this, uh, of this type, what you see are biostatistics departments funded by the NIH. What you see is the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, a new field funded by some of the same people uh, who led to this transformation in how we think about epidemiology. What you see is a focus on chronic conditions, not infectious conditions. You see pragmatic decision methodology, essentially the sorts of synthetic, consensus-based statistical work. And you see Bayesian adaptive methods, precisely the kind of thing that somebody like Cornfield is trying to introduce into the practice of medicine. So my point isn't, I guess, that modern medicine is just statistics, although I think you could make a, a solid case along those lines, but rather that you, me, people, patients, we're all now a collection of biomarkers. We're all a collection of data that gets suitably processed, and, and whether that's processed in the clinic or processed in the lab or processed uh, in, uh, you know, on a researcher's computer, Nevertheless, we're a set of variables that can be input into a risk equation or similarly compared to others who might share enough of our variables that they can tell us the best treatment that might work for us. And this is a fundamental transformation in how we think about medicine and health. And it's a transformation that I see the roots of, by and large, in this group of NIH statisticians in the 1940s and 50s who sought to reform the practice and the research in medicine, not by transforming the way numbers were currently used, but rather by introducing new methods from outside medicine into its practice. Thanks very much. Okay. I think folks here know the drill. You can use the microphones if you have questions. And um, there are many people online. Uh, anyone online, remember you can use the uh, send live feedback button and uh, offer some questions. Looks like we have one coming down here. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, Thank you. Apologies, I missed the very beginning, so, um, but, uh, so if I, if some of this was said, um, apologies, but it was if, an if amazing talk. If it's a hard talk. question, it was definitely in the first few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a, it's, I'm a palliative care fellow, so, mm -hmm. um, but, um, also very interested, you know, as a palliative care, very interested in, in prognostication mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and, and also, I guess, I, it's maybe also passe, but to ha say, like, I'm a Bayesian, right, which uh, I guess these days it's not, um, it's not so controversial to identify or it doesn't really matter as much, right, but I guess um, your talk, you know, you, you, is maybe two questions. One is um, that, you know, you, it, you're saying in the, in the very early stages, um, there was this kind of movement to incorporate more Bayesian reasoning. Mm -hmm. um, and at, I guess where I stand um, is that every RCT I ever see is using maximum likelihood mm -hmm. frequentist methods, that there is a very, it, it doesn't seem that we've made much progress where I stand as a clinician. And then I, I would also just as, um, you know, from the palliative care perspective, prognostication, you know, there's, um, there's a book uh, by uh, uh, Chris Stakis, who's a, a sociologist and palliative care called Death Foretold. And, is a paper called The Ellipsis of Prognosis, where he looks at the, um, if you look at the pneumonia chapter in Osler, and um, but in this same time period you're talking about, the percentage of the chapter that's talking about prognosis has progressively declined. So in, in a lot of these prediction methods, these, these move towards Bayesian, I guess I'm not seeing that it has been, um, that there's been much movement, um, and is this maybe that biostats is is kind of ahead of where we are in, in in medicine, and that we're really slow to uptake where you guys are, or or is it actually that the field of biostatistics is, has maybe not moved as either um, is my question. 
That's a good question. Uh, that, that's, a, that's also a big question uh, in terms of thinking both uh, about debates within statistics and how those debates uh, map onto, say, uh, the reformation of medical research. I, I, have, I have two things to say, which I'm afraid won't answer your question precisely, but, I, but hopefully we'll get to it. Uh, one is that there were actually lots of introduction of Bayesian ideas. Uh, in the example I'm thinking of is Cornfield in the late 1960s was really focused on relative betting odds as a better way to think about clinical trial design. And those did not get, by and large, taken up. So there's lots of examples where uh, research was done into uh, new ways of reconceptualizing trials that for people like Cornfield, uh, what they said is that this is how clinicians actually think a, a trial is, is working. This is how they think a trial is producing evidence. And so it's a better statistical model because it maps people's assumptions about uh, how a trial produces evidence. Uh, but it was never taken up in the same way that some of this early research was taken up. The flip side of that is that I actually see um, some of the success of the early methods, they were never called Bayesian. What, what they did was take a very old idea of inverse probability. That is to say, what we typically do is say, what's the probability of heart disease, or the probability of um, factors given that you have heart disease, and invert it. But they never called it Bayesian even though we would now relabel it as Bayesian. And so I think for Cornfield and some of the early researchers, what they tried to do was sneak in some of these methods without it seeming revolutionary. And it could be that part of the pushback that you see is actually once there's a debate about the best methodological ways, then it's much harder to move things forward. But in the early years, they didn't engage in that debate. They weren't interested in that debate. They were interested in what's useful for medical researchers. So thanks very much. That was um, really interesting and thought-provoking. You've made a really great case for how medicine has really been transformed by, by, by this quantitative approach. I'm wondering whether you think this is sort of an, in, in, in inevitability, um, you know, uh, because of the, the massive growth of, of medicine and, and data that, that it had to happen and these people were opportunistic in a sense, or do you think that this occurred because somebody thought, let's concentrate these kinds of people together, and, and that led to creativity? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, now, no historian is ever going to use the word inevitable and keep a straight face, uh, just because we'd be you know, kicked out of the profession uh, in most ways. That said, I do think part of what interested me in statistics and medicine is medicine is, in some ways, the strongest case for rejecting numbers. That is to say, they have a kind of bio, uh, biochemical model of how disease occurs. They have decades of research into the origin of disease, the treatment of disease, that do not need to involve aggregations or statistical measures. And so the very fact that at some point between the 1930s and the 1980s, you see this shift is to me much better attributed to, say, the changing nature of disease. So the fact that so many diseases seemed resistant to that older model, so the two classic examples are cancer and heart disease, that they just don't map onto that 19th century model. And yet cancer and heart disease, circa 1955, were two of the most important diseases to get a handle on. And so I think it's less that there's a kind of inevitability to the statistics, and rather that at the moment that this group was saying, we can deal with variability and complexity, they have two diseases where you have to deal with variability and complexity because a medical model is no longer serving uh, as, as a kind of good way forward for research. And so you can see something like the emphasis on cancer research where there's tons of money into virus, uh, kind of the cancer virus research in, in uh, post-war America. And then there's also this, we don't know what causes it, but we know what prevents it approach. And one of those yields uh, a lot of successes and the other one yields far fewer, at least if you look at it from the perspective of 1980. So I think there's a more pragmatic answer than a kind of inevitability answer. A lot for the talk. Um, when I think of reformation of modern medicine, I think of the role of clinical trials there. And you mentioned that um, this was sort of a topic you didn't really have time to cover. And I was wondering if it was more that you were focused on the earlier days when observational studies were sort of generating hypotheses to test and sort of 
where's the clinical trial, basically? <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, I'm afraid I would disappoint you by, by de-emphasizing the clinical trials. I didn't focus on clinical trials just for two brief reasons. One is that a lot of the machinery is developed before this period. That is to say, the machinery is by and large developed, the initial machinery, in the 1930s. Uh, and so when the first clinical trials are run, at the NIH in the early 1950s, the main way the statistical group is called in is when things go wrong. And so it's a different kind of um, emphasis, a different kind of impact. And so, for instance, when researchers want to take lots of looks at the data, it's, it's the NIH uh, statistical group. You can't just keep looking at the data as the trial is progressing. That doesn't work. So we need to develop new ways. Or if you have ethical quandaries, uh, the example of retrolental fibroplasia, if you have, you know, kind of uh, giving oxygen to infants, that might also might save their life, and it might also cause blindness. And so, if you have trials like that, how do you design a trial to be adaptive over time? And so, it doesn't fit the rest of my story quite as well because they come in to kind of solve the problems, and but the machinery pre-exists. So that, that's the only reason. Um, I find myself wondering as. Your, as you gave your talk about a phenomenon that I think many of us have observed. In the, the late 80s, early 90s, there was a huge trend among medical schools to abolish the requirement for mathematics uh, among the people applying. And it wasn't just that they didn't have to major in a science or mathematics. It was that they didn't have to have college-level mm -hmm. mathematics. Um, and then as time went on, there was this, as you say, this increasing emphasis on the quantitative aspects of medicine. And it occurred with a, uh, a medical workforce that was unaccom really unaccustomed to thinking quantitatively, as had been the case earlier on. And so I, I think of it as the era when the doctors who were observing things plunked the data on the desk post hoc of a statistician and said, now tell me what this <laughs> means. Right. And after all of this, now we're in the era of enormous data, like Framingham, but way beyond yeah. Framingham. Right. I mean, gigabytes beyond Framingham. And we're still asking the statisticians to say, <laughs> what correlates with what statistically, but there's nothing that says that that correlates biologically. So I, I just wonder if you could comment on this transition from starting with a mechanism and then moving to quantitative thought to now starting, it seems to me, with quantitative thought and then inferring a mechanism from it. What what does this mean? Well, I think you've nicely laid out exactly the, the transition that, that is surprising in a, in a sense, that, that essentially the hierarchy has been reversed. And so uh, in, in, in some sense, you could see an older version of this. So in, for instance, 19th century uh, public health, for instance, you might find death rates higher in the city. And then the question is, what causes higher death rates in the city? Like what, what leads to that? So it's not that the find the association, then go look for the, the, the cause is, is new, but rather that within medical research, it's, you know, within uh, clinical research, you see the same uh, inversion. The points you make about medical training are, are really good ones, and it's incredibly difficult. I mean, there's been a lot of study among psychologists of how hard it is to get doctors to think in terms of base rates. Uh, so when a test comes back positive, it's still more likely than not that the person does not have the rare condition. This takes decades of, of, of emphasis to try and get physicians to understand that. So I'm telling a, a much cleaner story. I think on the ground, what you'd find is a lot of frustration. Uh, and certainly that's a part of the story, that this kind of frustration does not make it into um, publications. But what I would, or um, uh, training, excuse me, in the same way. And, and certainly the same thing with consultants. I, there's an, almost not a year you can't find a statistician between 1960 and 1990 not complaining that if only they had come to me before they got all the data, this wouldn't be a problem, right? That, that is just like a uh, broken record of statistical consulting. Uh, but what I would just say in, in, in closing is just 
Um, to me, it's the power of a place like the NIH that can actually change what gets accepted as a grant and force it to be statistically uh, meaningful at the level of grant applications or force, say, the training of biostatisticians to develop across the country. That's how the changes happen, even though it is much slower. And certainly, if you're looking around in 1980, there isn't a sense of triumph uh, necessarily among the same people. Uh, but I think you're pointing to exactly the right forces. Yeah, I know we're past the hour, but a lot of the questions online, I just want to at least get one in. Sure. Still holding up, doing okay? The, okay. I'm All happy right. to get one more in. <clears throat> you made examples of how biostatistics entered the epidemiological methods. Mm -hmm. How would you say the epidemiological methods have influenced biostatistics? And is there a line between them at this time? How have the... It, that, that's a hard. That's that's a hard thing to, to distinguish. I, you know, I I as I look at the evidence, I see epidemiologists, epidemiological journals taking on way more of the uh, biostatistics than um, that is to say, influenced by the biostatistics. The biostatistics groups. I mean, in a sense, when the biostatistics groups are formed at at, at universities, they're formed within the school of public health. So they're formed in the context of the tradition of epidemiological training. So I, it's, it's intellectually, I think the, the, the force is going, you know, epidemiology is being trained by people who are not themselves trained as epidemiologists. I think the, the historical evidence is very clear on that. But then once you have the persona of the biostatistician, typically that person is trained now at a school of public health, which has kind of incorporated them into uh, the public health infrastructure in a way that I think would have been surprising to some of these individuals in the early 1950s. Thanks. We're going to close here. I'm not, it's not a, it is a question, but I'm, I'm just going to read the first part. Um, great talk. It makes me feel proud to be a statistician at the <laughs> NIH. So, uh, <laughs> Thanks to everybody who's here. Thanks to everybody who was online. What a great discussion, really appreciate it. It says a lot about our wonderful second Harden lecturer. I'd like to thank Chris Phillips sincerely. And um, we're looking forward to all of the publications that will follow from this. There are so many of them that could come. And we're all looking forward to the book and to his future visits. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you.